Good morning, friends. Hey, it's Sunday morning, 9 o'clock Pacific time, 9 o'clock Arizona time. Welcome to uh, the Deep Things of God with Brother Mike on twitch.tv. Thank you for tuning in today. I remember, uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me, that's easy to do. If you uh, want to call the ministry line, it's 602-636-5800. If uh, you want to send me an email, you can send me one at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I answer all my emails. You know, it takes me about an hour to hour and a half, two hours a day, depending on how many I get to answer all my emails. But I get around to them. And I thank you for uh, for your prayers and for your donations and all the things you've done for us. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, our schedule there at the... Uh, Deliverance Center. I will be in Carlsbad, California for a healing and deliverance service on July 15th. That's a Saturday. We'll be there for half the day at the uh, Carlsbad Senior Center. Look on the website for the details. And please remember we have two live Zoom services every week and they are just wonderfully anointed. Julie's Zoom service is Tuesday nights at 6.30 Pacific time. And Brother Rick's uh, Zoom service is Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And I'll tell you what, I recommend that you uh, attend them. Uh, Julie's is for women only. Send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, and I'll send you the, uh, the code and the uh, password. No problem. Fantastic services. Also remember, we have two. We have two live services every week, Thursday nights and Friday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time and Arizona time. That's broadcast on our YouTube channel and Rumble and several other platforms. And uh, recommend that you uh, tune into those services. They're fantastic. The deliverance services are also broadcast. My service on Friday nights, deliverance services live, broadcast live. And I leave my mic on so you'll be able to hear the people getting delivered and the conversations that lead up to it. And uh, you can check out some of the mistakes I make and then don't do them. Then check out some of the stuff I do good and then you repeat them. Okay, so that's how you'll do. You learn by trial and error in this business sometimes. It's fantastic. But God will be with you and bless you and he will have mercy on you. And that's how it works. Today, I want to talk to you about something very interesting. Some of the most famous uh, written material in the history of the world is in Matthew chapter 5. It's, some people call it the Beatitudes. Makarius is the Greek word for blessed, and it means someone who is happy or cheerful or gleeful or hilariously um, happy. Blessed. And uh, the Beatitudes list several blessings, but I interpret them a little different than most people interpret the Beatitudes. In the uh, healing and deliverance ministry, and in any ministry that you are called by the Holy Spirit to do, uh, these, uh, these Beatitudes directly apply to them. And if you don't have them, the probability of you receiving a ministry from the Lord is very low. It's very low. The probability of you getting anything is very low. Let me give you an example. Verse number three in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed, Macarius, happy, cheerful, are the poor in spirit. Now, the Greek word for poor there is takas. Takas is the Greek word for a beggar. Somebody you would see out on the street corner, and there's a lot of them now, particularly here in Phoenix. We have them all over the place. Homeless people begging for things out on street corners, traffic islands, and so on. Why is a beggar important in spirit? A beggar in spirit. What's he talking about there? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, generally speaking, but not in all cases. The kingdom of God is used as the overall kingdom of Jehovah, which would include the universe, the earth, and everything in it. 
the kingdom of heaven, generally speaking, not in every case, generally speaking, is referring to God's kingdom on earth. And if you are a beggar in for spiritual things, you will inherit the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it says that in Revelation. When you die now, let's say you drop dead in five minutes. I hope you don't. If you drop dead in five minutes, you go, if you're a born-again Christian, you go directly to heaven. But after the rapture, after the return of Christ, the second coming, we come to earth and we stay in the new Jerusalem, which is on earth. And we administer the kingdom of the living Christ on earth as his servants if we have been overcomers in this life. Many Christians in the future kingdom, the kingdom of Christ on earth, won't be in positions of authority or leadership because they were not overcomers in this life. Revelation 2, Revelation 3. The only people who are leaders and rulers in the new world order are people who overcome in this world now, in this life. This is your best life, and it will determine what you're doing in your future life on this earth in the kingdom of heaven and at the new Jerusalem. Not everyone has enormous responsibilities and blessings in the kingdom of the millennium. Not everyone has, not every Christian has that. Every Christian receives from God according to their works now, in your life now. And here you can see people who are, who see themselves as beggars in the spirit, people that are beggars. And that's a spectacular position to be in, isn't it? You know, Oral Roberts, when he was young, graduated from Bible college. He was pastoring a small church. I think it was in Eden, Eden, Oklahoma, but I'm not sure. But anyway, it was some small town in Oklahoma. And uh, he would read the book of Acts and he would go into a depression. He would look at the book of Acts and he would look at his church and he would see this incongruity. He couldn't believe it. Uh, it really bothered him that the things that God was doing in Acts was not happening in his Pentecostal church. I think he pastored a Pentecostal holiness church, but I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. And Oral Roberts began to seek God. He saw himself as a spiritual beggar. And he became a spiritual beggar. He became a God seeker. He became someone who was pressing in to find out why the book of Acts was not relevant in his church. And this went on for a few months, and he went into deep fasting. And he fasted so much, the congregation, he didn't tell them that he was fasting. They thought he was sick. They thought, some of them thought he had a terminal illness. He was dying. He had lost that much weight. But he kept praying, and then he finally came to a conclusion. He said, well, I prayed, and I fasted, and I'm going to now put my begging I'm a beggar for spiritual things. I'm going to put it to the test. He goes downtown. He rents the auditorium downtown. At, I think it was Enid. And, uh, you know, the, the auditorium sit, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people, something like that. And uh, he went down to the local hardware store and he applied for a job. And the guy said, yeah, we'll hire you. He says, well, I'm pastoring this church over here and uh, I'm having a service downtown. Uh, Sunday at the auditorium and I may be back for this job. Would you hold it for me? And the guy said, yeah. So he rents out this auditorium and he tells the Lord, number one, I got to have enough money to pay for this thing in donations. Okay. Number two, there has to be a notable, recognizable miracle happen in this service. Long story short, he has a service they bring him a little slip before he goes up to preach. They hand it to him. And it was uh, like 2 or $3 a 
above what the cost of the rental for the auditorium was. Okay, the prayer was answered. Oral gets up and he preaches. Uh, you know, you heard Oral Roberts preach. If you haven't, he sounded like a country preacher. You know, not a not a great orator, not a great speaker, just kind of an average guy. He gets up and preaches a short sermon on healing and then says, who wants to be healed? Well, some old woman came out in the aisle who had a withered hand, disabled hand. And uh, he reached down, he grabbed her hand right here and he lifted her hand up like that. And the hand instantly restored right in front of everybody. Everybody saw it. The place erupted with gasps and awes. And suddenly, Oral says, looked up. He said, I looked up and there was a line. Clear back to the back of the auditorium, a line of people wanting him to pray for him. And he said, numerous people were healed that day. Not everybody, but unbelievable number of people healed. And that started his worldwide ministry of healing. And uh, remember, when Oral died, yeah, the guy got off the track. Uh, he screwed up. When he died, he uh, he got sucked into this fake prosperity doctrine. And uh, he died $40 million in debt. And the city of faith and the university were all you know, in jeopardy. He put his son in charge of it, Richard. Uh, he was, Richard was a, a clown show. And uh, the, the whole thing uh, almost went into bankruptcy. Some billionaire or something bailed it out back in the 90s. And I guess they're doing good now. But the point I'm trying to make is this. Number one, if you fail in the future, God does not hold you to account in the present. In other words, if you come to God as a spiritual beggar and you are a God seeker and you are poor in spirit, which presupposes you to be a very humble person, God takes you as you are. You know, it's kind of like Billy Graham's. This, he always sang, come as you are at his services. Remember that? Well, that's how God takes you. If you come now, even if you are going to fail in the future, God does not hold your future failures against your present prayers. He does not do that. The same thing, exact same thing practically happened to A.A. A. Allen. A.A. A. Allen went to an Oral Roberts service and saw all these people healed. And God spoke to his heart and told him, I have called you to do this. So A.A. A. Allen went home to his wife, explained it all to him. And you know the story. He started going into his closet and praying. And he failed several times with the the last time he got in there, he prayed for numerous hours and suddenly a supernatural light came through the ceiling down on to him and this voice started to speak to him and, and he gave him 13 things he needed to do before he received his healing ministry. What am I talking about here? A.A. A. Allen and Or Roberts, even though they ended poorly, God did not use the ending of their life against their present prayers. And God will not do that to you either. God will not do that to you either. Okay, let's assume you're, you're a God seeker now. And hypothetically, you're going to backslide 15 years from now. Doesn't matter. God only takes you as you are now. And he doesn't hold your future against your present. And so here you can see in the Beatitudes, the first one is people who are God seekers. They see themselves as spiritual beggars. And in this particular verse, the prosperity doctrine does work. The prosperity doctrine works spiritually. Not financially, that's all a crock. Spiritually, if you see yourself as a beggar seeking God and needing more of God, needing the anointing, needing the blessings, needing the call, God will hear you and he will bless you. Then Jesus followed up that verse with this one. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's exactly what Sister Edder did, 
Catherine Kuhlman, A.A. A. Allen, or Roberts in the very beginning, when they were young. They were mourners for the power of God. They were mourners for the presence of God. They were God seekers, hardcore. And Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you've ever seen any of the old tapes of A.A. A. Allen or Or Roberts on YouTube, I recommend you go watch them. They're, they're really interesting. You can see the joy coming out of these two guys after the people are healed in services. Uh, so they, they laugh, they giggle. They, they're, A. A. Allen used to jump up and down. He was a jumper. Or Roberts was a screecher. Oh, my Oh, my. He would cry. Oral got emotionally. See, they're blessed. They're macarious. They're cheerful. They're joyful. They're hilariously happy. See, they are comforted. But they had to be a mourner first. You don't just get the blessings of God dumped on you. Okay, you got those blessings. Go ahead. Okay, next thing. You got it. Go ahead. Now, here's a, these are yours. Boom. Okay, go doesn't work like that. It's not going to work like that. You're not going to see that happen. It's not going to happen. You got to follow the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn for what? Mourn for seeing the power and salvation of God save their relatives, their family, their friends, their city, their church. Mourners. Spiritual mourners, okay? That's followed up in Romans chapter 8, isn't it? Sure it is. For the Holy Spirit, he groans for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He groans through us, but only people who are mourners receive the anointing of the Spirit like that. I hope I'm making sense here this, this morning. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. What's he talking about there? The millennial reign of Christ. The meek. Praus is the Greek word. It means people that are humble and gentle. Okay? When you are a mourner, when you are a God seeker, oh man, when you are poor in spirit, you are by definition a humble person, and humbleness draws in the presence of the incredible Spirit of God. Humbleness is what he likes to see. He loves to see people kneel at Calvary. He loves to see people kneel with tears in their eyes so he can sprinkle the blood of Jesus on their lives and on their souls. Humbleness is enormous. The legendary British evangelist Smith Wigglesworth would hold healing lines, and they said while he was praying for the people, he was weeping. He was weeping over them. Wow. Big, tough guy. Gruff. Very blunt person. But a very humble man. A very humble man. You see, people who get around the Holy Ghost, if the demons don't trick them, they always realize that nothing they're doing is coming from them. And they're always have this sense of being completely dependent on the Spirit of God. That's a, a method of humbleness. People who have the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost are not people that usually like to go around collecting compliments or kudos from others, they're fine without them because they're looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They're not looking to themselves. People that are humble are the only ones that are going to reign in the millennial, in the future, after the return of Christ. The other Christians will not be doing that. The people that rule the planet Earth are the Christians who applied the Beatitudes and Revelation 2 and 3, and they became overcomers in this life. 
once you're dead, it's too late. You can't make it up. Now is your moment. This is your time. Verse 6 ties right in with what I've been teaching. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be cortizo. What does that mean? Cortizo. It means to eat until you're gorged. Eat until your gut is hanging over everywhere. To be chuck full. Blessed are they which do hunger. He's using an eating analogy here. Brilliant. Blessed are they which do hunger. Oh, now this word is also very interesting. Penao. It means people who are starving, people who are famished. It's not people who have a general hunger. That's for church people. People who have a, you know, a general hunger. You know, hey, I think I'm hungry. I think I'll get a bite to eat. That's for Christians. That's not for disciples. Disciples, pinao, are famished. They are dying to see God move. These are God's seekers. You see that? People who are starving, starving, thirsty after righteousness, for they shall be gorged. They will be gorged with it. <laughs> These are great scriptures. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Here, this ties in directly to the great apostle Paul's teaching in Galatians on reaping and sowing. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Whatever a woman sows, that shall she also reap. You get out of it what you put into it. And this is what God's telling you. Look, I'm looking for some people that are famished. I'm looking for some hungry people. I'm looking for some people who are mourning. I'm looking for people who are who see themselves as spiritual beggars. I'm looking for people. And then God pours out the glory. This is a powerful teaching. This is, this is what can happen to you. Who doesn't get any of these things? Well, the obvious. People who are Christians, people that go to church. They end up with nothing. They become spiritual losers. Why? They don't see themselves as spiritual beggars. They don't see themselves as starving for God. They're not starving for God. I have an altar call every Friday night at the Arizona Deliverance Center. The Holy Spirit has come to 100% of them. There's never been a time he hasn't been there. It's been amazing. Deeply grateful for it. But during the beginning of the altar call, as I was saying Friday, what I do is I just, I don't rush through it. You know, I just kind of patiently wait and watch and see where the Holy Ghost is going to hit. He'll hit over here, then he'll hit over there, then he'll hit this person, then he'll hit that one. But he'll skip this one and that one, this one, this one, skip, go to that one, skip, skip, go to that one. What he's doing there is he's looking for people who have the Beatitudes in your soul, right here, in your souls. Have you got the Beatitudes? Are you starving for God? Well, I'm not starving. Well, your prayer then is, Lord, help me. Help me to starve. And, but don't pray that prayer casually. This is, this is not a pretty sight. Am I a spiritual beggar? A spiritual beggar? Hmm. I've been saved for 25 years. I, I know something. <laughs> oh, boy. Once you reach that spot, friend, it's over. Come home today. Come home. If you see yourself in a different light after today, wow, I have not arrived. I'm like Paul. I'm not there yet. I have not arrived. But I, I do this one thing. I forget those things that are behind me. Or Robert's for, 
leftist pastorship, leftist church, leftist congregation, forgot about them and moved forward with the power of the Holy Ghost. A. A. Allen did the same thing. Left his church. Assembly of God booted him. He opened up a place called Miracle Valley in southern Arizona. Remember that? That's what Paul did. I forget those things that are behind me. I reach for those things that are before me. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul implemented the Beatitudes for himself. He saw himself as a spiritual beggar. He saw himself as a mourner. He mourned for the revelations of God. He mourned for the power of God to help others. He mourned to reach out to the lost. He mourned to visions and dreams. You see that? The Holy Spirit skips these people at the altar. And I saw it in my own eyes. I see it every week. I've seen it for years. Don't tell me it doesn't happen. I know it happens. I've been watching it. I watch it. Skip, skip, hit. Skip, skip, hit. And what he's doing, he's looking for a beatitude heart. Boom. Somebody here who's hungry. Oh, man, I'm starving. I'm famished. I'm thirsty. I'm chafed. Ah. I got cotton mouth. I'm so dry. I'm dehydrated. You see that? That's that's how you get the deep things of God. Somebody hunting for God who's famished will do anything. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Catharus is the Greek word. It means somebody who's cleaned their house. Somebody who's cleaned out. People are motivated to renew their minds and clean out their minds. Restore their conscience and clean out their conscience. People are motivated to do that when they're hungry for God and they're mourning for God. And they see themselves as needy people who are spiritual beggars. Pressing in for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus their Lord. They will cleanse themselves, clean stuff out. Catharsis. Clean it out like you'd empty out a closet. They'll do that voluntarily because they want God. That's what happened to Oral Roberts. He sacrificed his time in prayer and fasting. That's what happened to A.A. Allen. He went in his closet and hid in there. Right? That's what happened to Catherine Kuhlman. She was pastoring a church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she had been seeking God for years. She had been hungry for years. She had been meek and humble and broken for years. And one morning at her Pittsburgh church, can't remember the name of it, small church, a couple hundred people or so, she's pastoring a church and some woman came up to her after the service, okay, and says to her, Pastor, while you were talking about healing, she said, while I was sitting there, my back got healed. And look, she bends over, she walks around, nothing wrong with her. Well, Catherine knew this woman had a bad back. They'd been praying with her for years. And while she was sitting there, and Catherine says to her, who prayed for you? She said, nobody. I just sitting there. And that morning in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a spear landed a power in Catherine Kuhlman's soul. Guess what happened? Yeah, she quit. She quit and started her international ministry that God was going to start healing people in droves and not touching any of them. Nobody went around and prayed for them. They just got healed in their seats. And it started that day in Pittsburgh, but it's actually started before that when Catherine Kuhlman became a beggar after the death of her father. I hope I'm helping somebody right now. You see, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a heart set. The Holy Ghost uh, has discernment for the reins of the heart. He looks in there and he sees what's going on in there. 
is this guy really hunting for Jesus? How about this one? Is this one really a Christ seeker? That's what he focuses on. He really looks at that. And then he adds to it humbleness, brokenness, mourning. Blessed are the meek, for they shall reign during the millennium. Blessed are the merciful. Merciful people are humble people. Merciful people don't see themselves on a pedestal. They see them as a regular person, and they will have mercy. And then God grants them mercy when they need it. Can you imagine it? Then he wraps this thing up. It's really powerful. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they shall see the kingdom of heaven. Once again, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of Christ on the earth, the millennial, people who are in authority during the millennial. Most Christians are not in authority during the millennial. They're in the new Jerusalem. God bless them. Thank God for that. But the people that are ruling and running the planet earth for Jesus and the ones that are giving direction and control to angels, that's what Paul said. The angels are serving us here, right? Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. And the angels will serve us then, but only those, Revelation 2 and 3, who are overcoming Christians here. This is your best life now. Sorry, Joel. Your best life now is in the Beatitudes. You must become a broken, humble God seeker. And if you do that, and if you do receive the power of God, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. There's no question about it. There's no way to get out of it. People are not going to like you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to speak bad words about you. And that's all positive. You want people trashing you. You want them to say bad things about you. When I get a bad review on Welp or Google or YouTube, somebody makes some comment about a, a, what a walking turd I am. I look at that and go, all right, yes, made it. It's in the bank. Winning. Yeah, winning. Winning. Hey, if people think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, man, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong. You're not challenging them enough. You're not speaking into their life with the words of truth enough. If they like you, like these crotch rot, rectalized TV preachers. Oh, they're so great. They're so wonderful. Oh, it's be funny. Uh, you get a bunch of that crap, the, the demons have got you. You're in the bag. You're absolutely in the bag. Oh, he's so entertaining, so funny. Oh, he's, he's just great. She's just wonderful. She's Look at her go. You go, girl. Once that happens to you, you're in the bag. The devil's got you in the bag. You've been bagged. No, no. If you get the power of the Holy Ghost and you, you know what it's like to be a spiritual beggar and you know what it's like to be meek and humble and you know what it's like to be a God seeker and you can push your way in with authority aggressively, God will take you no matter who you are. Hey, Oral Roberts was... Nothing uh, was a really a nobody. He was a nobody. He was pastoring a small church, Pentecostal church. He had no great education. He was not an extremely intelligent person. He was a mediocre preacher. Uh, he was not a good looking guy, kind of looked like a country bumpkin. But he had the Beatitudes here. And before he died, everybody knew his name. Did he screw up at the end? Yeah, sure he did, of course. Guy went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but God never judges your future on your present. Always remember that. If, you, if you're great in the future, of course you won't know it because it's in the future, but if you're bad in the future and you fail, you backslide, you do whatever it is, doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is Billy Graham singing, singing that song. Come as you are. You come right now. 
you get the goods from God. But if you come in with arrogance and pride and, oh, I, I, I know the scriptures and I've been saved for years and I'm just, forget it, just stay at church, vegetate out, finish it out and then stay in the new Jerusalem during the millennial while humble, broken people now go out ahead of you and rule and reign as kings and priests with Christ in the new world order. I can't overemphasize that enough. I cannot over. Most Christians will not rule and reign as kings and priests to Christ in the new world order because they did not follow Revelation 2 and 3. He that overcometh, those are the four words Jesus used, what is it, seven or eight times? He that overcometh, King James, shall, boom, and then he fills in, he fills in the blank. And that's that's got to be you. That's got to be you. You you get your devotional time and you start begging. Lord, I'm I'm a spiritual beggar. I'm not where I should be. I don't have the power. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the anointing to help these people. And I want it with everything I have within me. Oral did it. He was a regular guy. A. A. Allen? Are you kidding me? He was less than a regular guy. He was a full blown alcoholic when he was in what was it, seventh or eighth grade? Full blown alcoholic. I mean, he was he was an absolute textbook loser. Once again, not a good looking guy, not exceptionally intelligent, mediocre preacher, not very good at it, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> wow, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the Beatitudes right here. Yeah. If God can take somebody like Catherine Kuhlman, uh, she looked like somebody had dug her up. She had nothing. I mean, literally nothing. No looks, no body, no, no very homely woman, rotten hair, bright red hair that looked horrible. Her IQ was average at best. Nothing. Oh, not one thing special about Catherine Kuhlman, except what? She had the Beatitudes. Yeah. When the Holy Ghost takes you over, friend, you become a very, very special person in Christ. Very special in Christ. Now you're not special. No, we're not special people. The Spirit of God comes upon you. Wow. Awesome. But that's never going to happen to you unless you learn the Beatitudes of the heart. And Jesus warned you in verse 11, blessed are you when men shall revile you. What does that mean? word revile mean? Anedizo is the Greek word. It means verbally abuse you. Verbally abuse you. I've been verbally abused numerous times over the years, as you can imagine, being in the deliverance ministry. And every time it happens, I giggle and move right on to the next deal. Blessed are you, happy, macarious, joyful, cheerful, hilariously happy are you when men shall verbally abuse you and persecute you and say, and say, speak is the Greek word. Apo, speak. All manner, all manner, all manner of evil, evil words against you. What it actually says in the Greek there is paneros rhema. When they say perverted words against you. And it's false, it says. Okay, it has to be false. Now, if people speak perverted words against you and they're true, that's a totally different Bible study and you don't belong on this one. Okay, that's, you go over to the repentance Bible study. Okay, go pull it up on YouTube. But if they're, if they're verbally abusing you using perverted words, ponderous rhema, perverted words against you, 
And those words are false. Verse 11. And they're for the sake of Christ. Okay. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad. What does that word mean? Agaliao. Exceedingly glad. That means to jump for joy. Jump for joy. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Hey, friend, you got to have the Beatitudes. Let's go now. Come on. You got to have them in here. Right in there. Nobody can stop you. No one can stop you. You can't be stopped. Can you imagine somebody stopping the Holy Ghost? That's a, that's a ridiculous thought, isn't it? It's patently absurd. Guess where, guess where the Beatitudes come out of? The Holy Ghost is stimulating it. He's stimulating it to bloom forth in you. That's what, that's what you want. Nobody wants to just live their life and die and have it amount to nothing, right? All sinners do that, number one, and almost all Christians do it, number two. But look, you're on this podcast, and if you're watching me on this podcast, you don't fall into those other two categories. I'm sorry, but you just don't. Okay, you are, you are a person who wants to be a monster in the spirit. Okay. You want to be like a walking tsunami. You want to be like a walking earthquake. What is a tsunami? It's an underwater earthquake. They're both the same. And that's what happened in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Remember? Acts chapter 2, it happened there. An earthquake. Acts chapter 4, they were praying. They were begging God. They had become spiritual beggars. And they were asking the Lord. To grant unto your servants healing and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child Jesus, Acts chapter 4. Right? And what happened? Boom. Earthquake. And that's what you want to be. That's your goal in life. You want to be a walking, talking earthquake for God. But it's never going to happen if you don't get the Beatitudes here. And you don't become a God seeker. You don't see yourself as a needy person, desperately in need for a miracle from God. And people who are humble cannot do that. They just can't do it. I don't know how many times over the years, in counseling session and at the altar, I'm going to say a few hundred, I've run into people who have very high IQs. They're very intelligent people, and they are the most difficult people to get healed and delivered. It's just awful because their intelligence causes them to overanalyze and overprocess spiritual things, and they end up spiritually bankrupt. And other people come to the altar. Other people come in my counseling uh, sessions. They're not like that, and the Holy Ghost, he just jumps on them absolutely amazes me. If you don't believe me, go to my Facebook group. It's called Blessings, B-L-E-S-S-I-N-G-S. -S. Go to that Facebook uh, and just scroll there for the next hour reading these testimonies of people who had the Beatitudes in here. They saw themselves as spiritual beggars. They were starving for God. They were starving for God. The ones that weren't starving for God that I saw in counseling sessions, I got a couple of techniques that I have used over the years that work, they work about 50% of the time. So I try those techniques on them to try to break through the numb skull spiritual shell they're living in where they can't get any blessings from God, no healing, no deliverance, no finances, nothing, no peace. They can't get it because they're a numb skull with their spirit life blocked. Not good. So I use those techniques on them, and you know, about half the time it works. And they get they get these amazing breakthroughs. And you know what the funniest thing they say to me? This is the most frequent thing 
that people have said to me over the years after they're finished with their deliverance, a lot of times I'll ask them pretty much most of the time I ask them, so how do you feel right now? And they go, I feel light. I feel at peace. And then they'll kind of giggle. I have seen that several hundred times. I swear it. I've seen it several hundred times. I swear it. It's amazing. But I've never seen it with somebody who didn't have the Beatitudes. People who weren't God seekers. They didn't see themselves as spiritual beggars. They didn't see themselves as meek. They didn't. They saw themselves as knowledgeable and well-adjusted and solid Christians and been saved for years. They were solid Christians, okay? But we don't need Christians. What we need is disciples. Christians are a dime a dozen. They're virtually useless. What we need is you to make your move now. Because your time's running out, as as is mine. Nobody, no Christian who dies, is guaranteed to be a ruler and a king and a priest in the new world. It doesn't say that in that verse. Did you happen to notice that? It didn't say every Christian was that. But it says exactly the opposite in Revelation 2 and 3. Only those who overcome. And the only way to overcome is to do what Or Roberts and A.A. Allen and Kuhlman and millions of others, the only, the only way to do it is what they did. They let the Beatitudes out of their soul and they gave it to God. They pushed their way through, see? And if you look back over your life, I want you to listen to me carefully for a second. Let me close with this. Thank you for joining me every Sunday. I love you. If you look back over your life, if you could point areas, and I mean literally, where the devil has just taken a club and bashed you over the head. You can specifically remember them, right? Now, I know your uncle molested you. Somebody, you got fired. Somebody lied about you. Somebody backstabbed you. You got a car wreck. I mean, over and over again. Let me tell you something. The devil's going to pay for all that himself personally. Book of Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter 20. He gets tossed. You know, and I've asked God numerous times. I don't know if I'm going to get the prayer answer, but I asked him, I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to see the angel that picks him up and throws him into the lake of fire. I'd like to be, I'd like to be somewhere where I could watch that. I've asked for it. I don't know if I'm going to get it or not. But let me tell you something. That's not the only time the devil is going to pay for something. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You know when the next time is? You're going to make him pay. You owe him. 